On this Easter Sunday, we want to celebrate life. And the way that we're going to do that for the next couple of minutes, there's really not much left for me to say because the, the proclamation has been made through testimonies. The proclamation has been made through song. Um, I just want to draw your attention to a text of Scripture for a few minutes. So if you have your Bible, turn uh, to Luke 24. If you're using a pew Bible in front of you, you'll find that on page 884. Uh, the text of the scripture will be up on the screen as well, so if you'd prefer just to follow along on the screen, that's fine also. But as is common on Easter Sunday, I want to look at one of the resurrection stories, and this time from the Gospel of Luke, because if you have been with us for the last six weeks, we have been on a journey in Luke's Gospel, trying to understand in a fresh way what it means for Jesus to be one who is intentional about seeking and saving that which is lost. And so his, his entire mission, his entire ministry has been moving in the direction of seeking and saving that which is lost. In all four of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell the story of the resurrection. Why would they not? It's the culmination of all of their stories. The fact that this one whom they have presented, this one named Jesus, went to the cross on our behalf and didn't just go to the cross, but he went into the tomb, and then three days later, he rose again. And that is what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. And so all four of the gospel writers want their audiences to know that Jesus is alive. In fact, as we looked at over the weekend, if you were here for our musical performance, you remember we said that Paul identified this truth as the thing that is the most important truth that we could ever know. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, that Jesus was dead and that he was died according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. All of the prophetic vision of the Old Testament is pointing to this moment. And so we can get into the habit of looking at that and thinking about that and celebrating that and we can go, okay, it's Easter and we talk about resurrection and we can quickly move past the reality of what it must have been like for those who were there on that very first day. And so my invitation for you today is to attempt to hear the story in a fresh way, to attempt to place yourself there on that Sunday morning with all of the emotion that must have been included there. For for the ones who came to the tomb to find Jesus, they were his followers. They had staked their life on what he was about. They were following him around Galilee. They were following him around Israel. They had come with him to Jerusalem. Just a week ago, they were ushering him into the city as the king. They thought, this is the Messiah. Hosanna, they said. Lord, save us thinking that Jesus was about to go in and conquer the Roman authorities. And they were anticipating this glorious moment, and their week just unfolded in a completely different way than what they were anticipating. For this one who they were following is arrested, is given a false trial, is charged with treason against the Jewish government and against the Roman government. The crowd of, of witnesses who are there call for his crucifixion and he goes to the cross humbly, recognizing that to accomplish what Jesus or what his father had set out for him to do required him to pay the ultimate price so that you and I could live. But for those that were experiencing it for the first time in that moment, they couldn't see all of that. They didn't have all the pieces of the puzzle put together. And so imagine yourself as one who was here in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 1, where it says that on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. The story begins in a very obvious way, doesn't it? These, whoever they are, they're not even named yet in the story, but these women, 
as we'll see a little bit later, are coming to a tomb, and they've got spices with them, because what is obvious to them is that two days ago, Jesus died. And so we're going to the tomb to see a dead man. That's what they were anticipating. Some of you have lost loved ones, and when you go to the graveside, you go to remember, you go to uh, tell stories, you go to honor that life, but you don't anticipate that that person is going to be there, that that person is going to be alive because, well, because dead bodies don't come back to life. And that was the natural thought of the people, the women that went to the tomb on that day. They went carrying spices. The spices were meant to finish the burial process. You remember that Jesus' crucifixion takes place on a Friday afternoon. If you turn the page back to the end of chapter 23, you see that just before the preparation of the Sabbath, the women go and they prepare the spices, and then they observe the Sabbath on that Saturday, and then early in the morning, they come to the tomb with the spices that they have prepared in order to finish the burial process. But there was full anticipation in their mind that they were coming to a tomb that was full. But as we read, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. This is not what they expected. And you can imagine the emotion that might have been happening in their life when they come around the corner and they come to the spot where they know just two days ago they put Jesus, their friend, their person that they were following, they put him in that tomb and I watch them roll that stone in front of that tomb and as they come around the corner and they see that same rock and they go, wait a second, That stone is not where it's supposed to be. What would the emotion be that would be associated with that? Confusion? Anger? Frustration? Beginning to have cycles of doubt? What's going on here? Someone's messed with the stone. Something is amiss. Something is not the way that it's supposed to be. And when they went in, it says, they did not find the body of the Lord. So not only is the stone moved away, but as they get closer, they actually step into the tomb, and in the morning light, they see there's no one in there. There's no one there. Why? What have they done? Who took him? Where did they go? Where is our Savior? Yet two days ago was bad enough. Now you're telling me they took his body away? Now we can't even give him a proper burial? Now we can't honor him for the friend that he is? He's not even here? And the text tells us that there's not anger in them. There's not rage in them. The the text actually tells us that they were perplexed. It says, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Perplexed is a kind word. I can imagine that there was a lot of other emotion that was probably going on there. What has happened to Jesus? And now, who are these guys? <laughs> who are these two guys? And why are they wearing such bright clothes? What's going on here? We're so confused. Imagine the emotion. I mean, the emotion of the week, I mean, from the super high highs of Palm Sunday to the Jesus kind of getting in the face of the religious leaders at the temple and going, yeah, he's, it's going to happen, he's going to happen, and then boom, arrest and crucifixion and beating and denial, all of this stuff happening, just a wave of emotion, and now he's not here, the stone's gone, and there's two guys here who are dressed really brightly, and we don't understand what's happening. And we don't know what to do. And who are these guys anyway? Well, the other gospel writers tell us that these two are angels. That, they are, that there's no one there in the tomb. In fact, it says that these two arrive in dazzling apparel and the women who were there are frightened. Now their perplexed nature has turned to fear, and I think rightly so. They were confused, and now they're scared. And, and it says that they fall on their faces and bow their faces to the ground. And the men ask them a really interesting question. Why do you seek the living 
among the dead. Well, the reason that we're at this cemetery is because this is where dead people are. I mean, this is where you go to see dead people, to honor dead people. What do you mean, why do you seek the living among the dead? You, the question should be, oh, you're here to seek the dead among the dead. And that's what you do here in the cemetery. But their question is not that question. Their question is, why do you seek the living among the dead? Just a parenthetical thought. You and I, when we make a decision to follow Jesus and we declare our lives in obedience to his the same way that we saw in the waters of baptism, we become those who are living among a culture that is dead. We are the living among the dead. And what I mean by that is that for us in Christ, life has been secured, eternal life has been secured, and our future is bright because of what Jesus has done. But for those who are not in Christ, who have not had the light of revelation go on in their hearts and minds, remain in darkness, and the text says, or the Bible tells us, that they remain spiritually dead. We are the living among the dead. And so when the angels ask the women, why are you seeking the living among the dead? They also ask, he is not here for he has risen. Now, what would that sentence have felt like to them? Are you sure? Can you prove it? Could you bring him to me so that I could verify what it is that you are saying? But instead, look at what happens. The angels say, he's not here, he's risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? Do you remember that? Do you remember the message? Do you remember what he said to you? Now, if I was directing the movie at this point, I would have the scene just completely freeze. And all of a sudden, we would get into the minds of the women that were there, and you would begin to see flashbacks of Jesus' teaching. Places where he did tell them that this is what was going to happen to him. Places like Luke chapter 9, verse 20 through 22, where it says, Then Jesus said to them, Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, You're the Christ, the Son of God. And he strictly charged them and commanded them to tell no one, saying, The Son of Man, I must suffer many things. I will be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. I'll be killed, and on the third day I will rise again. He said that back in chapter 9. But for some reason, they didn't remember that. I would have had them flash back to another scene just a few verses later, Luke chapter 9, verse 43, and all of them were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were marveling at everything that he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand the saying, for it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him, what he really meant. And then I would have them picture another scene. Now in Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 34, taking the 12 aside, he said to them, here's what's going to happen. See, we are going to Jerusalem. Everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets is about to be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked, and he will be shamefully treated and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Verse 34, but they understood none of these things. For the saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what he said. Jesus was very clear about his mission. He was very clear about what he was doing and why he was doing it. And in that moment, in the euphoria of Palm Sunday and the anticipation of this new messianic king, his disciples, the women, those that were following after him, they missed the clear message that Jesus needs to die at the hands of sinners because that's how he conquers death. Because on the third day, he's going to rise again. And they missed it. 
And my guess is that there's some in this room today who have missed that message as well. You've heard the story of Jesus. You consider him to be a person of history. You consider him to be someone who may be worth listening to, but you have not yet seen him as the one who conquers death. And this is where the women are because it says in verse 8 that in a moment they remembered his words. And imagine what that flashback must have been like. Oh, that's what he meant. Oh, I remember when he said that. Oh, do you remember when we were walking in that situation and he made that comment and we didn't know what he was talking about? This is what he was talking about. The reason he's not here is because he's done what he said he's going to do. And then verse 9, in returning from the tomb, they went and told all these things to the 11 and to the rest of the disciples. You remember Judas is off the scene at this point. The 12 has become 11. The women who were there at the tomb, they go back. And the, the ones who have received the good news now become the messengers of the good news. And that's exactly the way that it's supposed to work. When you have received the good news, you are now entrusted to be a messenger of the good news. And our message as those who follow Jesus Christ is that he is not here, he is risen as he said he would. He's alive. He's not here. Why would you seek the living among the dead? Jesus is not here. So he goes back, they go back and they tell the 11 what has happened. Now the women are named in verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene. Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and other women who were with them who went and told the apostles. Now these women make their way up to wherever the apostles are staying, and they tell them what they saw. And the response should be, what? He's a live celebration, right? Like, let's go. Let's go figure it out. Let's, let's celebrate the fact that he did what he's going to do. But no, that, they didn't quite celebrate with the women when they came to tell them. They didn't quite have the right response. They might have said, well, you know, women aren't really great with directions. Maybe you went to the wrong tomb. I mean, I don't know that they would have said that. That's not in the text. But they might have said something like that. They might have said, well, in your hysteria, you probably, missed, uh, you, you probably misunderstood what, you know, what was going on. I'm sure there's a mistake here somewhere. In fact, the text tells us exactly how they responded. Verse 11, but these words seemed to the men to be an idle tale, and they did not believe. Do not miss the fact that those who are the first recipients of the fact that Jesus is alive are women, and that it is women who are faithfully responding to what they have seen and heard by telling other people. The reason why it's important to highlight that is because in the society in which this is happening, women are not known to be credible witnesses. Now, that's not me being joking. That's just the culture of the day. If you were having a trial in a court of law, a woman was not considered to be a reliable witness for the case. And yet here, the ones who are reporting, the first witnesses to report of Jesus' resurrection is entrusted to women who do with it exactly what they should. They take it and they share that message with other people. Now, they are not responsible for the response of the men. <laughs> They're responsible to be faithful with the message. And in the same way, when we give the message to other people, we are not responsible for their response. We're only responsible to be faithful to what it is that God has called us to do. When we see and believe that that tomb is empty and we see and believe that Jesus is risen, the natural response of us is to be able to declare he is risen indeed. And how people respond to that is not up to us, but we are responsible to faithfully share that message. The words seemed to them to be an idle tale and they did not believe them. Can you believe how tragic that story would be if it ended right there? How sad would that be? They, we don't believe you. No, we're not going to go look. We're not going to go. No. He can't be. We saw him die. We literally saw him die. We put him in the tomb two days ago. Praise God for Peter in verse 12. But Peter, 
who just a few hours ago had denied that he even knew Jesus. Something was stirring inside of Peter, and he wasn't going to let the women's testimony sit without examining its outcome. And so it says that Peter ran to the tomb, and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. It's interesting that the linen cloths are, are mentioned there because the linen cloths are associated with death. And the things that are associated with death remain, but the one who has conquered death does not. And that's the way that Jesus works. The things that were associated with death remain behind, but the things that are associated with new life move on forward. And so the invitation for all of us this morning is to know and understand and believe and have faith that this one named Jesus who went into a tomb on Friday on our behalf allowed that tomb to be transformed, if you would, into a womb from which new life would come on Sunday morning. For new life was born for all of mankind on Easter Sunday. And for those of us who are hearing the message of Easter, this is the invitation of new life for you and for me. Death has no hold on me. The grave has no victory on me. He is not here. He is alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And his invitation to all of us who believe in him is to join him in celebrating victory over death. Isaiah chapter 25 verses 6 through 8 says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, of full of marrow, of aged wine that is well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all people, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people will be taken away from the earth, for the Lord has spoken, and it is true. And so when we gather around the table, the Lord's Supper table, we gather to give thanks that the, that the shroud of death has been removed that the feast table has been set, that the anticipation of our king is that we will join him at that table in joyful celebration as those who are in Christ, co-victors over death, alive forevermore. And so here at Redwood Chapel, on a weekly basis, we take the Lord's Supper. We take the, the, the bread and we take the cup and we, and we take and we eat and we drink and we do it remembering what Jesus has done and anticipating that he's going to do it again, that he's going to bring us into his kingdom. And so our ushers have the elements of communion. If you did not pick them up when you came in, you can raise your hand. I'm, I'm sure that our ushers can bring down some trays that may have some elements. If, if we don't have enough, I apologize. But if you would like to partake with us, we're going to remember Christ's sacrifice. And we're going to proclaim that he is coming again. Let me pray for us as we prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper. Father in heaven, would you... In this moment, remind us of your faithfulness and your goodness to us, of the fact that you have conquered death forever, that Jesus was dead, but he is alive forevermore, and that in his life, we can have victory over sin and death. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. What a beautiful day. Amen. A beautiful day.
Uh, if you're a guest with us today, we want to welcome you specifically and thank you for coming to our church this morning. We have a connections table in the lobby where we would love for you to stop on your way out. There's a team there that would love to greet you and welcome you. And they have a gift for you and, and uh, just want to send you with a blessing this morning. And for all of us, we want to start thinking about what our next steps are and how we continue to get connected. And so I just want to send the invitation and say we're here every week. We worship every week. 11 a.m. is our normal worship time. We gather together in small groups and communities throughout the week, sometimes on Sunday morning at 9.30, other Bible studies throughout the week. But this is a relational disciple-making church, and our desire is that everybody who's a part of Redwood Chapel would be connected in the process of growing as followers of Jesus Christ. We want to see that happen with kids. We want to see that happen with adults. We don't believe that anybody is outside of the age range for who should be a part of that relationship. And one way that we want to help kids do that is by an upcoming event called the Life Summer Camp. Uh, Life Summer Camp will be happening in June, and registration is open now. If you go to our website, redwoodchapel.org, you can register your elementary age kids for Life Summer Camp. It will be a great opportunity. You'll find out much more about the event on our website, but we want to make sure that you're all aware for yourself, for your families, for your kids, for your grandkids, that there is an opportunity for them to be connected to a, a relational environment that will help them to grow as followers of Jesus Christ. Plus, it'll be a lot of fun uh, coming up in June. Would you stand with me as we prepare to be dismissed this morning? And we'll declare it once again on our way out. He is risen. He is risen indeed. God bless you. Have a great day.